Well, thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to be back. If you're watching this live, happy Groundhog Day. Uh, and the groundhogs are saying, I'm a varmint, not a meter man, but uh, there's a couple of people posting. Happy Palindrome Day. Everybody knows that? You know, it's 02022020, first time in 909 years. I've just been reading about this. Would ask me yesterday, I wouldn't have known about it, but I think we've got to wait another 111 years, and I think all of us will be there, but we've got to wait another 111 years for that. And happy Super Bowl Day, though I really don't have much of an opinion on that. Uh, finally, happy Let's Talk Cholesterol Day, because it's an important topic. Uh, it should be resolved. It shouldn't be necessary to review, both for you very smart people and broader audience, uh, the role of cholesterol in health and disease. You know, many things in life aren't black and white. Cholesterol isn't bad. Cholesterol isn't good. Uh, too much of some things uh, can be dangerous from, uh, you know, simple stuff like breathing too, uh, drinking too much water or alcohol to uh, cholesterol. It's good for you, but you don't need too much of it. So let's go through the science. I don't know how exactly Steve talked me into this topic. It's a joyful topic. It's an important topic for every one of us. But I've never given this talk previously. So and there is a little effort to put together a brand new talk. But I like that, actually. Uh, it's an educational process for me and others. Uh, I am from Detroit. I think the bio may have said that. I do have an active practice. Uh, this is my 43rd year being plant diets. I don't call it plant-based, plant diets. So. I thank the very bad cafeteria in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan for pushing me towards the salad bar in 1977, and that little difference is why I'm on stage today, because I just incorporated it with the rest of what I do. So I have had the really fascinating opportunity to be inside the human body thousands of times and be inside human heart arteries thousands of times by angiography and now more and more by CT scanning, and they really are a beautiful thing. I mean, part of making a decision to be healthy is understanding what good health feels like. I mean, it feels really good as I approach my 61st birthday. I've never spent a night in the hospital other than as a resident, never had an operation, and take no prescription drugs. It's really, really good to feel healthy, but it's also good to actually see what healthy looks like because uh, heart disease is sadly a very silent, very quiet, progressive problem, and you can't see it much on the outside. You can see a few little clues on the outside, but not much. Uh, and these are just these beautiful channels. Maybe you know this. There's 50,000 miles of arteries in the body. You know, around the world is 24,000 miles. We can go twice around the world. That's how many arteries we have. You probably know the word, not a very common word, the endothelium, because it's a favorite of Dr. Esselstyn and favorite of the Nobel Prize Committee in 1989 when there was enough science to award three researchers data. But in those arteries, there's like a single layer of wallpaper, one cell thin, that is the endothelium. If you were to take it all out, it would fill seven or eight tennis courts of tissue. Think about how big that is, maybe a high school tennis court you know, complex. It's actually perhaps the biggest uh, organ in the body in terms of its function. Makes that wonderful, wonderful little chemical called nitric oxide and many other helpful and damaging chemicals. I mean, if you had only one thing in life that I'm gonna lead a life that helps my endothelium stay healthy, you'd have great blood pressure, you'd have great brain function, you'd have great heart function, you'd have great sexual function. And what you're doing is actually making your endothelium healthy when you're at this conference and uh, enjoying the excellent food and the education. Just get up and move around a little. I'm a very bad sitter. I don't sit. I think I'm allergic to it. A couple more. Oh, there we go. There's that, uh, those blue arrows pointing to that single layer of cells, the endothelium. We know it's there. It's a little hard to test how healthy the endothelium is. Hopefully I don't see any young children. If a man is able to have a solid sexual response, your endothelium's working to some extent. If your blood pressure is normal, you probably got a healthy endothelium. But there are blood tests. There are um, some other non-invasive tests that actually Dr. Katz mentioned a bit on his panel last night that he's done studies on, I've done studies on. 
Um, but it's a tricky little thing to see it. So value your arteries, value your endothelium. Uh, just in case you're not an invasive cardiologist, I don't think there's another in the room, but if there is, I welcome you. That's what an angiogram looks like when you've taken good care of your body and maybe also have had good genetics. Beautiful, clean, branching arteries, rushing all the blood you need to any organ in your body. Again, 50,000 miles. But we can mess it up, and genetics can mess it up. We mess it up more than genetics mess it up, though, as we'll talk about. And there's the problem. I mean, these are pathology slides that you're probably not routinely looking at. But that is a cross-section through the artery that previously looked like a big open channel or a big open pipe if you're in the plumbing industry. And you can see now it's all full of stuff except for that little, little narrowing. Um, we're competing with the slot car people, and apparently there's an emergency for the uh, Camaro group. Uh, but you can see how small that little opening is. If that artery is going to your leg and you're walking upstairs, your calf is probably going to ache, called claudication or peripheral arterial disease. If that artery is going to your heart, you might get breathless playing tennis or get a little tightness in your chest or flunk a treadmill stress test if there's a reason to do it. If that was going to your carotid artery to your brain, you might have a little visual impairment or speech impairment, a little TIA mini stroke. And if it's going to your pelvis, you might not find any response with amorous activities or even to the famous blue pill. So uh, we do a pretty good job of messing these things up. That's just one more. That is not a happy smile. Uh, that is an artery that used to be wide open. And there's all kinds of things in there. One thing that's not in there, there is no sugar in there. You can't determine under the microscope any sucrose or glucose or fructose. Or ribose. Uh, there are a lot of cells, white blood cells. You've heard the word inflammation. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about inflammation in a few minutes. There are a lot of white blood cells, macrophages and mono, uh, monocytes and stuff. There's um, calcium. Some of you are aware there is a CT scan, CAT scan you can do that can tell you if your arteries are aging or not, if you don't know that already from a previous heart attack or bypass. It detects the calcium that would be in an artery like that and gives you a gauge to your true age inside. Uh, there actually are crystals. Uh, crystals aren't only uh, salt crystals we might put in the house for better karma. Uh, there are actually somewhat dangerous cholesterol crystals inside these kind of badly diseased arteries. One of the theories is that on the day you convert from being a seemingly healthy person to having a heart attack within a few minutes or an hour of the onset of feeling poorly, these little crystals, these sharp crystals, much like the crystals in a gout toe, if some of you have had gout, know how horrible that is, these little crystals actually can puncture through the lining of that artery and cause a blood clot to finish the horrible act off. Uh, but I do want to just back up what I just said. There is cholesterol in these plaques. There isn't sugar in these plaques. I'm no fan, and I'm not recommending you rush out and go to the restaurant, get all the white sugar packs, and take them home as a health move. Don't do that. Uh, but there is cholesterol in the plaque. It's a constant constituent. And it wasn't there at one point, and it got there. The only way it can get there is from the bloodstream. And therefore, just intuitively, the amount of cholesterol in your blood might relate to the amount of cholesterol plaque you develop. And we'll go through that. Does cholesterol matter was the title. So that's an important concept. Um, this is an interesting slide that shows some hope for America in general and our young people in America. And you might ask why. But uh, on your left is uh, data from Korean veterans that died in the war around age 20 to 25 of trauma, of blasts, of bullet wounds. And they uh, had autopsies, not every one of them, but a significant number. And the dark blue is the presence of any evidence of plaque or atherosclerosis in their arteries. And the light blue is the presence of severe plaque. Well, you talk about 20 to 25-year-olds, 80% had some evidence, and about 15% actually by that young age already had at least one artery that was severely clogged with atherosclerosis. You know, Korean War, uh, McDonald's was rolling big time, America was smoking like fiends, uh, medical care wasn't very advanced, or detection and lab work and such. 
The next two bars are the Vietnam and the Iraqi uh, Desert Storm experience. The hopeful news is these severe plaques have actually diminished and the presence of plaque in these very young people have diminished. A lot of people say, why? Because in general, I'm not that optimistic we've gotten that much healthier than the 1950s, but smoking rates have dropped a lot. Uh, actually, in fact, last week it was announced it's the lowest smoking rates ever in the history of the United States. Thank goodness. Um, our ability to treat blood pressure with a single pill, our ability to lower cholesterol with a single pill is much more widely available. And unfortunately, there are actually 20 and 25 year olds that are on those medications. So uh, atherosclerosis at this young age is still an issue. Um, and in fact, these are 20 year olds. By the time you get into your mid to late 30s, we do see a lot of heart attacks uh, from atherosclerosis. So you are undoubtedly aware, but it is also not just Groundhog Day, it's Heart Month, February, that for 102 years, heart disease has been the number one cause of death in the United States. It actually began in 1918. There were still more heart deaths in 1918 than flu deaths, and every year since. Uh, there is a little competition going on with cancer rivaling heart deaths in a couple states. It slightly exceeds it, but as a total country, heart deaths are still number one, cancer number two, and often the next uh, you know, thing put down there is something like emphysema, chronic lung disease. That's not an entirely true and honest list that's often put out. This is from the American Heart Association, because if you look at that pink box, you can see the biggest circle is heart disease, the second biggest circle is cancer, but according to studies at Johns Hopkins University and other locations, actually being in a hospital and being a patient is the third leading cause of death, medical errors. Rather frightening idea, the wrong drug, the wrong blood transfusion, the wrong operation, the bed sore, the infection that doesn't respond to antibiotics. Um, it's a real deal. Uh, I'm a frequent reviewer of medical charts to assist attorneys in defense or other such matters in the court. And uh, the number, in fact, last night and this morning, I was finishing a report about the inadvertent administration of a drug dose to a young woman 10 times higher than was supposed to occur and it caused a heart attack. This stuff really does happen. Uh, a very important clue there is not to depress you on that topic, but be healthy so you don't need a hospital very often. You know, visit other people and be kind and get the heck out of there and don't eat in a hospital. But if you can design a life where, you know, you need a medical team, but hopefully it's a, a rare and outpatient experience, uh, you have the best chance of avoiding the third leading cause of death in the United States. Quite an uh, amazing statistic, actually. So why do we clog our arteries? How do we go from 50,000 miles of beautiful pathways, clean, healthy endothelium, no cholesterol crystals inside the arteries, no uh, accumulation of white blood cells and fibrous tissue, to the fact that by age 40, 50, 60, 70, and certainly beyond, uh, it is the predominant cause of disability and death. What the heart is happening to us? Um, well, if you look at just, you know, you can learn from different ways. You can learn from basic biochemistry. You can learn from epidemiology. You can learn from the holy clinical trials. But there was a rise in the number of uh, cases and deaths from heart disease that was noted. It's a disease that's been around. In fact, there have been a number of studies in the last decade of mummies. Can you imagine a research project where you take an Egyptian mummy to a hospital and you do a CT scan to identify that the blood vessels are calcified in age? And they are. Um, there was, anybody know who Otzi the Iceman was? You guys know Otzi the Iceman was a a uh, Neanderthal uh, wanderer who fell in a crack 5,000 years ago in Europe and was frozen intact uh, with his body preserved as well or better than any other 5,000 year old, other than George Burns to his last few days. Um, and at any rate, uh, Otzi has been the source of many, many studies. He's been written up in Scientific American. It's O-T-Z-I if you have any interest. It is pretty fascinating. But Otzi, the Iceman's arteries, are quite involved with atherosclerosis. 
They actually did gene studies on Otzi the Iceman, of all things, and he inherited a gene called 9P21 from his mom and dad, Mr. and Mrs. Otzi, uh, and I don't know exactly the rest of his diet and such. I believe he died with either an arrow or a blade, so he was a traumatic death. Uh, not of a heart attack, but he died with heart disease. So the disease has been around, but World War II in the United States when it ended was a joyful time, I'm told. I'm not quite able to recall anything till 1959, and I uh, came into this world crying, screaming, and kicking. But the late 40s and early 50s, the grand time of 50% of America smoking and food supply and food companies like Kraft really starting to develop uh, options for us. There was a big spike in heart attacks. A lot of it was male. Females get a little advantage on average till post-menopause. Um, and uh, there were a lot of people dropping dead. That prompted an evaluation. Why do people have heart attacks? That's uh, why the government started funding something called the Framingham Heart Study. You may have heard of that outside of Boston. 1948, right after World War II, they had to answer the question. When Eisenhower had his big heart attack in 1955, it prompted even more funding and questioning why do people have heart disease and heart attacks. It really wasn't well known. The general concept was it's just a disease of age. Your arteries clog up. But indeed, there are people I take care of in their late 80s, early 90s that have no detectable atherosclerosis. It's not inevitable. Uh, there are Famous examples like Mr. Nathan Pritikin, who ran the Pritikin Center and for majority of his adult life, life ate a very healthy diet and had a lot of fitness and good lifestyle, who had autopsy at his request, had super clean arteries. So there are examples of it, but uh, this spike prompted us to dive deep. And as I said, if you drive outside Boston, you can go visit the town that changed America's heart because uh, there was funding, and it's 1948 that it started. The Adventist Health Study was funded in 1958. So it was by the 1960s that we started to get some clues, of which cholesterol was one of the clues. And you can see the Framingham Study began. Um, the term risk factor, you've probably heard that. You know, risk factor is really important, actually, just so you know. Even in your conversation with your friends, family, peers, you know, Smoking is a risk factor for lung cancer and heart disease, but there are some smokers over 100 that have never developed those diseases clinically. A high cholesterol we'll talk about is a risk factor. It's not the risk factor, and that's a subtle but important. High cholesterol is a risk factor. There are people with a cholesterol 325 that don't apparently have clogged arteries, and there are people with a cholesterol 150 that don't uh, and haven't avoided clogged arteries. Uh, it's part of an equation I'll talk to you about. But it is statistically, and for you, I mean, not wearing a seatbelt is a risk factor for dying in a car accident. Now, hopefully you'll never have a car accident and you could go through life without your seatbelt on. But it's a wise you know, decision to pay attention to risk factors. And then they keep on doing and publishing and following. They're actually uh, still following the grandchildren of the original Framingham participants as to their health. And we've learned a lot. It's not perfect. But we've learned you know, the issue that if you know risk factors, if you know that the person having bypass probably had an issue with their blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, smoking, fitness, genetics, why don't we pay attention to people 10 or 15 years earlier, turn the sink off, turn the things that drive disease off, and then we don't have to crack your chest and put in stents and operate on your leg arteries and uh, take blue pills for things that should happen naturally during our life. You know, turn the faucet off. This is a slide, if you've not seen very often, uh, used by Dr. Dean Ornish, but it's also sometimes credited, if you know the name, Dennis Burkett, who was the a physician from England who spent a lot of time in Africa. He's often considered the king of fiber. He thought if we all just ate more fiber, and I can assure you there's no fiber in chicken or beef or pork or eggs. If we ate more fiber, we'd turn off the faucet of a lot of chronic diseases, uh, and we still believe that. So cholesterol does matter. We learned that from Framingham. I'll show you that. We learned that from the Adventist Health Study. We've learned it from a week ago in research studies, but it still is something being 
discussed and debated. And as I said, whether you can read every one of these or not, uh, this is from mainstream cardiology literature, the American College of Cardiology. This is actually Kurt Hong. Kurt Hong's a friend of mine. I didn't notice that that's where the credit was. But if you look in the orange section, uh, primordial prevention is an interesting topic. What if we could construct a world where people had such easy access to health they never developed high blood pressure. They never developed a high cholesterol. What if we really only fed people like at this conference, we got people to uh, go to a gym or a fitness center every day. Uh, we had people that could sleep, no access to cigarettes. We create this biosphere three where we live this perfect light. So you never had a risk factor. But for the majority of us, you know, the presence of abnormal cholesterol, abnormal blood pressure, abnormal blood sugar, this pre-diabetic, uh, pre-heart disease uh, concept called metabolic syndrome, you know, it leads us on the road. But the point is, again, when somebody contends with you about whether cholesterol medicine good, bad, whether your diet, lowering your cholesterol is good or bad, maybe you need it for your brain, cholesterol is a risk factor, not the risk factor. Uh, it is not a perfect relationship. You can't look at the lab value and say you've got blockage. Lab value, you don't. Uh, but you certainly have to consider it. Well, how did we learn that? So some of you have been through either panels or other lectures, like Dr. Willits yesterday, who's heard the name of somebody not quite as celebrated now as he was during his career. He passed away, I think it was 1994, at age 100.5. Uh, uh, American with two PhDs, one from England, one from uh, California, who moved to University of Minnesota and spent his entire research career uh, in a lab under the football stadium at University of Minnesota. He was very interested in science on starvation. He actually developed the K ration during World War II. What can you provide soldiers small, very dense in calorie, so they could put it in their backpack and if they're in the jungle, they could get enough calories to function. The K ration, K for keys. Uh, it wasn't anything you'd want to eat based on the density of calories, a lot of items like beef jerky and such, but he was a nutrition expert, authentic. And then he got interested in heart attacks because in 1948 he did a study on executives in Minneapolis and what were the possible risk factors for their heart attack and was an early uh, researcher on the role of smoking, good and bad, and diet, good and bad. These weren't uh, obviously uh, known things. He's standing, he is on your very left in the suit uh, in Italy with two Italian scientists, but the third gentleman with the white mustache and white hair in a suit is um, Paul Dudley White, MD. He was the head of cardiology at Harvard. He was President Eisenhower's cardiologist. Uh, Keys and White would travel the world studying people's cultures, talk to doctors, how often do you see heart attacks, is your hospital full of people with that disease. When they came to Naples, they were kind of like uh, uh, the Sunshine Boys or something of the day. When they came to Naples, they were instructed, we don't see heart attacks. It was 1951. They were very puzzled by that because uh, Paul Dudley White saw heart attacks in Boston and Keyes as a PhD was aware of them in Minnesota. And they stayed a while, and that is the nidus of what we now call the Mediterranean diet, research studies based on the observation, whatever you're doing in Naples is a whole lot better than we're doing in Minneapolis and other cities in the United States. The love affair of Keys for Italy was so great that he ultimately bought a home in a little town, when I say little, 300 people, I've been there, about an hour south of Naples called Piopi, uh, and he and his wife would spend, if you're in Minnesota, it's a good plan to every winter go to Italy for six months and lead research projects from his home in Italy. It became a center of others visiting and research and celebrating life. Um, you would never call Keyes a vegan. He did end up writing three wildly popular books about the Mediterranean diet with his wife, Margaret. She was a very accomplished researcher and author. Um, these books uh, really introduced to the American public, cut back on red meat, eat more fruits and vegetables and whole grains, get rid of your butter uh, and your lard. But his cookbooks and his books, uh, you'd have trouble eating out of. The idea that he introduced a low-fat diet to America is quite wrong when you actually study what he teaches, but it was 
olive oil, not butter, which most other studies say if you're going to make a leap, that's a very helpful leap to make. So does cholesterol, does saturated fat and such uh, have a relationship with heart disease? Well, how do we know it? Well, here's the data. This is the research project of Dr. Ansel Keys and 17 other scientists around the world uh, called the Seven Countries Study, begun in 1958. Uh, officially published in 1970, but they kept on accumulating data. This is 25-year data. This is your risk of dying of heart disease, like a heart attack, and it's the amount of saturated fat in your diet. Now, you and I just had a bowl of delicious breakfast. It didn't tell us saturated fat, but you didn't see butter on it, so that's good. You didn't see cheese on it, that's good. You didn't see red meat on it, that's good. You didn't see uh, coconut oil all over it, which from a saturated fat intake is good. Plant diets tend to be very low in saturated fat unless you are a big user of coconut and palm oil. So if you look over there way to your left, like tea, that's Japan. The Japanese, that's a specifically, I think it was Okinawa, uh, a very low natural content of saturated fat in their diet. They eat a little bit of fish. I think it's about 3% of their calories come from animal products in the 1960s when these people were being followed. And if you go way to your right, that high point E, not very high for health, E is Finland. E is something we talked about in the panel last night, North Karelia. If you love butter and you love sausage, you're living in North Karelia, Finland. The amount of calories you're getting from saturated fat alone is a quarter of all calories, and you can see the rate of heart disease and follow-up is enormous. Now, these are called associations. The critics will say, those that love their butter and their sausage from a scientific standpoint, maybe the people in Finland point E smoke more, sit around more, stress more, maybe the water's hard or the water's soft, you know, there's a lot of variables you could throw in. And maybe the people in Japan, letter T, you know, are more fit and have more community, have more faith, some other factor that relates to heart disease. But these studies do something that scientists call multivariate analysis. You know how many of these people are diabetic, are smokers, are on high blood pressure medicines. All those things are factored out before a graph like this is made. So it's an attempt to isolate alone saturated fat and its relationship to heart disease. And you can see, if you've seen the Game Changers, you saw something like this, and I've handled enough blood in tubes, this is real, but if you look way to the left, after your morning breakfast, assuming you didn't rush out and pour coconut oil all over it, your blood if spun down would be, you know, motor engine oil clear. This is what we have in common with the slot car people in the next room. <laughs> and if you ate at the lobby, restaurant and you had some sausage link and a cheese omelet, your blood would look uh, foamy and white and thicker and much more prone to clot and much more prone to carry a high amount of cholesterol in it. Uh, and that's blood. What does blood travel in? It travels in arteries and it is possible for that cholesterol to transfer across that holy endothelium uh, and enter into the wall of the artery and stay there for a very long time, your entire life, and develop plaque. In terms of cholesterol itself, this is blood cholesterol, same study, Dr. Ansel Keys. This is really how we learned it. 25-year uh, follow-up, your risk of dying of a heart attack and other heart-related illness based on how high your blood cholesterol is. And that uh, is where we have gained much information to believe that, yes, it does matter what your cholesterol is in your blood. It's a risk factor. But if you look over there, cholesterol is over 300. Uh, unfortunately, we're reasonably common in the United States in the 1960s. And we're very common, again, in Northern Europe, particularly Finland. And blood cholesterol is way down there in the 120s, 130s. Uh, these are not drug studies. These are just either differences in genes, that's one aspect, or differences in the environment and the diet. And most studies have shown it's not the genes particularly, because when people move from uh, Serbia or Japan to communities, or we don't even have to move anymore, we brought the KFCs, the McDonald's, to Serbia and Japan, uh, the diet changes, the blood cholesterol goes up, and the heart disease will follow a decade or two decades later. So does cholesterol matter? Yes. Now, is there somebody in Northern Europe with a cholesterol 330 that's 98 years old and playing cards? There is, because it's a risk factor. But 
if you're a betting person, you're going to bet and say, I want to know my numbers, and maybe it'd be better if they were more like Serbia than like Northern Europe. But that was before studies were done. And I alluded to, but specifically, uh, something that's been mentioned a couple times. Ni is a community in Japan, Han is Honolulu, and San is San Francisco. These were men studied by Dr. Ansel Keys and other members of his research team. What your blood cholesterol is, what's your blood pressure, what's your presence of heart disease, living in your native Japan diet and the entire environment. Yeah, let's pick up and move the family to Hawaii. We want some beach time uh, and some American lifestyle. And then let's move to San Francisco. Of course, these were just observations. These people moved on their own. But their surroundings changed. Their genes didn't change within this relatively short time. So it showed that the Japanese living in Japan, lowest cholesterol, very low heart death rates. As they moved to Hawaii, they got to a middle ground. As they moved to San Francisco, welcome to America, the land of abundance, and the land of abundant cholesterol. So if you look even just to the left, blood cholesterol levels in Japan are in white, in Honolulu are in black. We started to add in a couple hamburgers, a couple fries down the street on the Waikiki Beach. But then you get to San Francisco and you got the whole spectrum of American food and stress and pollution. It's, it's food mainly, but there are other factors. And all of a sudden your cholesterol's up and your risk of heart deaths are up. Pretty striking data that again, genes matter, but um, your decision what you eat, uh, which isn't entirely dependent on what city you live in anymore because we've exported Western diets everywhere, are pretty crucial. Now, this is high-level stuff, but you're a smart crowd. Um, something called Mendelian randomization. We learn about science in different ways. We learn about it from the studies I just showed you, the hard work of the seven countries study for years, going to little communities and taking questionnaires. They actually brought the meals back from the seven countries study. They brought actual food back to Minnesota to analyze the content. These were difficult studies pre-computer. But now we're space age medicine. So Mendelium, maybe you recognize the word Mendel, and maybe you remember Gregor Mendel from your uh, genetic classes and the, the white peas and the uh, green peas, I believe. But we can now identify in databases where we have some blood samples from people, and these databases can be 500,000 people. We know there's certain genetic changes that will keep your cholesterol 10 milligrams per deciliter lower than the average American for your whole life from birth on. We know there are some genetic inheritances that make your cholesterol 10 milligrams per deciliter higher than the average American from birth forward. It's a genetic influence. It's not influenced by your diet. Your diet will have other influences, these genetic, these inherited uh, factors. So I participated, my name is Aaron Bold, uh, from a study, you can also see Kim Williams, many of you will recognize his name as a leading American plant-based cardiologist at Wayne State University. The effects of exposure to lower LDL cholesterol beginning early in life on your risk of developing heart disease. And this is using this interesting technique. You have to have a database of some genetic data and you have to know what happened to people over time. But can small changes from birth be really powerful? The implication here is, what are you feeding your kids and your teenagers? Because it, it makes a difference, but let's show you the data. So these are, I believe there's nine. These are nine genetic inheritances. We all have them, but depending which one we have, these are nine that if you inherit these from your parents, your LDL cholesterol genetically will be lower from the day you're born forward. So, you know, it does not matter, uh, and it's not something that happens in your mid-50s. It happens when you're four months and 14 months and 24 months. And it's looking at how much your cholesterol is lower than the average population just because you won the lottery and inherited this. They're not very rare. Some of us in the room got this. Some of us didn't get this, and we're frustrated our plant diets have not brought our cholesterol down, and genes do matter. Uh, at times. So does the diet quality and thyroid function and stress and other factors. Uh, there's this terrible plastic out there. Now, I don't know if anybody's mentioned the conference PFAS. PFAS, it's 
been in like Hush Puppies and 3M, and it's everywhere. It's called the forever plastic because once it's in your fat tissues, it's essentially impossible to get out. Uh, the Environmental Working Group just uh, analyzed 20 studies in the United States, or 22, and I think 20 of the 22, the water supply that we're drinking has PFAS in it. That was in the last two weeks. Why do I bring that up? Because PFAS, it's in your body right now, I guarantee you, raises cholesterol. And maybe you're a plant eater and your cholesterol is not falling enough, but you're in a community that has, like we have in western Michigan around Grand Rapids, very high blood levels, very high city water levels of PFAS, because we have a giant hush puppy shoe factory that's been dumping this stuff in the water supply, apparently, allegedly, for decades and contaminating uh, the area. So the point is, genetics matter, diet's the most important. There are these other extraneous, but still important consequences. So uh, would it be cool to have a lower LDL for life? And what it says here is, if you indeed inherited these favorable genetics, we looked at the odds of developing clogged arteries when you're 40, 50, 60. All those boxes are to the left of a straight line. You're lower risk. You're going to have a lower cholesterol because of genetics, and you're going to have a lower risk for heart disease. In fact, we plotted it out based on the particular spot in the genetic code. The more it lowers cholesterol, way over there on your right is a particular genetic inheritance that lowers cholesterol quite a bit on average from your genetic input, nothing to do with your diet, and the other ones less so. But if you do that, uh, the greater will be your reduced risk for heart disease. Again, the question is, does cholesterol matter? These Mendelian genetic studies show it matters, but it also takes time. So I'll give you another example. I like to pull things out. There's a little movement in the food world now that's gross and uh, of uncertain sanity called the carnivore diet. People that are eating three meals a day, two meals a day of meat and nothing but meat. It's quite a popular movement actually amongst uh, the certain health and fitness arenas. Uh, there is uh, a paper in 1930 that supports its impact on health favorably in two humans and that's the entire database. That's not a lot. Uh, and we're talking here about data from hundreds of thousands of people, and I just mentioned two. But some people say they feel better eating only meat. Well, when are they going to show up with heart disease if that raises their cholesterol and their inflammation? It might be in a decade. This has been popular for about two years, maybe three years. There's a couple people who have been doing it longer. And I point that out. Heart disease is a slow, steady risk, like a snake just moving through the grass till it bites us, but it was there all along. Um, but it does matter a lot if you have a low cholesterol earlier in life. Again, feed your kids well, and they probably should have their cholesterol checked too. This is an interesting comparison that we did in this study. The orange boxes are how much does lowering your cholesterol lower your risk of developing a heart attack in studies that have been done, large studies with 4,000 or 10,000 or 18,000 people. The black boxes are how much does lowering your cholesterol lower your risk of a heart attack if you genetically got this bonus, this advantage. So from birth, your cholesterol has been lower than the average American, or in your 40s, 50s, 60s, you entered a research trial and your cholesterol was lowered by a drug. They both lower the risk, but the risk is much more profound if you started at birth. So you can see uh, on the left, that little black box or blue box that's way to the left, you've really dropped your risk of uh, a heart attack if you started a lower cholesterol from birth. You've lowered it if you've taken your statin medication for an appropriate reason, that being something like Lipitor, Crestor, Zocor. But it's not surprising that some of these studies aren't massively impressive when you start lowering your cholesterol at age 55, perhaps. Um, because you've had the ability to develop plaque for years and years and years and years. It's much more impressive, apparently, 
to keep your cholesterol naturally low, like they have in Japan prior to the introduction of Western food and such. It's a very interesting comparison. And if you look at these two graphs, again, the lower arm is the results from statins. The upper kind of straight line is the results from genetically lower cholesterol. If you've had the good luck to inherit some of these determinants, and you could do 23andMe and actually find out if you have these, or you could have your whole genome measured now, reasonably cost-effective, I have, to see if you've got these or not. But the impact of lowering your cholesterol from a drug is present in studies, but it's nowhere near as impressive as starting early in life, in this case, on a genetic basis. Of course, you can ask the question, what if we feed our children well from childhood on and we test them and they favorably have lower cholesterol because we've developed a low saturated fat diet for them? Does it absolutely mean it has to be a low fat diet, but a low saturated fat diet? We've kept their cheese down or none. We've got their red meats down or none. We've kept their egg yolks down or none, for example. Like some of you in the room are raising your children in a plant-based home. Uh, you might be able to reproduce that upper curve and really drop heart risk. That'd be the very hopeful news. And maybe that's slightly why the Korean veterans had more silent plaque than the Vietnamese and the Iraq uh, veterans that I showed you a while back. But it is very interesting, Mendelian. So that was our research project, but um, just recently, 2019, I think we can agree, just recently, uh, our colleagues in Europe seem to be a little more progressive than some of our colleagues in the United States, and specifically cardiologists, cholesterol experts, uh, ESC, European Society of Cardiology, EAS is the European Atherosclerosis Society. They put together some recommendations, um, and they're meaningful in this debate. Cholesterol matters, or you can go to the bookstore today and buy books called The Great Cholesterol Myth by a cardiologist who is selling his marinara and olive oil sauce right on the table over there. I like the guy, but I don't like his approach to cholesterol and heart disease. I, as an individual, he's a very fine man. You can go look at that later if you like. So this is from the European Atherosclerosis Society. This is 2019. This is about as up to date as it gets. And just read the top line. If somebody gives you grief because you've said, I've chosen to eat this way because it's helped me lower my cholesterol and I want to stay healthy and avoid disease. And they say, well, cholesterol doesn't matter. Didn't you read the National Enquirer? You can read the first line. Scientists don't debate this. I mean, and scientists go back to Ansel Keys, and they come all the way forward to Mendelian studies and other studies. High LDL cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. And this is actually data from not just the uh, Mendelian randomization study I showed you that I was a member of at Wayne State University. But this is a number of them in uh, follow-up joined together. But if you look at that, um, there is you know, 194,000 uh, people in one study, you know, 400,000 in another, 196,000 if my eyes are working in a third. And we have two people on the carnivore diet. I mean, numbers don't always matter a lot. You know, you don't need a lot of people in a study of how powerful parachutes are when you jump out of a plane. You might need two and you're done. But for something subtle in human physiology, numbers do matter. And the basic trend here is from these Mendelian studies is uh, if you inherit these genes that lower your LDL from birth, you're very much favorably uh, less likely to develop heart disease uh, decades later. Um, I can't tell you how to change your genes, but again, the message is at any phase in life, design a diet that lowers your cholesterol to healthy levels. Some of us will respond more than others because of differences in our liver metabolism. Some of us will respond more than others because of these influences, genetic influences. Some of you will be frustrated, and again, question I get all the time, uh, emails I get, why is my cholesterol not 120 like I've seen in a Dr. Esselstyn lecture or a Dr. Ornish research publication, and I'm doing it, and, you know, it's a complex situation, but try, and uh, I'm not uh, anti-medication if needed. So 
There's a lot of data on this slide. I'm not here to tell you, go get a prescription for Lipitor or not. That's something you discuss with your doctor. I am telling you, eat a diet that naturally favors a low blood cholesterol, which is a low saturated fat diet, which is basically the plant diets we're eating here, and hopefully you're doing at home. But this European Society of Cardiology has finally come around to teach what some of us, uh, including myself, have been practicing in the clinic. If you go way to the lower right, the higher your risk of dying of heart disease, the more intensive therapy you need and the lower cholesterol you should try and achieve. So if you've had bypass, if you've had a stroke and a clogged artery that's been operated on, you're at high risk for things coming up. Uh, sprouts may not do it alone. Try the sprouts, try the gym, try good sleep, try uh, you know, certainly to drop your weight to a healthy level. And if you go way up uh, on the left to a low risk person, how do you know you're low risk? Well, it's the traditional things. I don't smoke, my blood pressure is great, my blood sugar is great, my cholesterol is 140, I don't have any mom, dad, brother, sister with a heart attack or stroke at age 38. Um, I sleep at night, my waistline's thin, but you can also actually check your arteries by an ultrasound or a CT scan of the heart. That's a different talk. Uh, but all, if you're very low, you don't need prescription drugs. That was actually a fairly radical thought uh, in mainstream medicine five years ago, but even our American Heart Association now says many people taking Lipitor-style drugs actually are so low risk they don't need them. But you have to check. You have to actually calculate or look at an artery and all. So we are making progress. Now, would it be a good idea for everybody on this spectrum to eat a whole food, plant-based, naturally low saturated fat diet? Absolutely. Um, and in most cases, the written material is to introduce lifestyle changes before you start a prescription drug. In reality, that often is glossed over in clinical practice, unfortunately. All right, so lesson number one for everybody is for you and your relatives and children, if you have, check your cholesterol early and you know, repeat it now and then. It can change. Uh, it can change for the better because this conference or last year's conference or the Game Changers has spurred you to even upgrade your diet more or uh, it can change for the worse because health issues have come in or the holiday season was a tough cookie period and for a lot of people uh, uh, that I speak to in my clinic, that is a tough period. The weight goes up and the willpower goes down. But I do want to turn for the talk that uh, does cholesterol matter? It does, but it's not the only thing that matters and it is a risk factor. It's not absolutely determinate. So this scary picture is supposed to be an artery full of plaque with all those steak knives, I usually call them daggers, but let's call them steak knives. And each of them, if you could read it, is a different chemical in the blood that could potentially precipitate clogged arteries. I'm not gonna go through every one of them, but I wanna tell you about a couple of them that are there or should be there um, and upgrade your knowledge about what causes clogged arteries so you can have a couple practical points when you leave. And, take care of that. And uh, some of them respond to eating well, some of them don't respond to eating well, even more frustrating. So I did uh, point out in one of those slides of heart arteries, you know, that there were white blood cells in the plaque. White blood cells is basically a fancy word for pus. And you think about that as an infection, you've got a uh, infected wound and it's draining. Well, that very process, we don't call them artery pimples. I have heard people speak of it as that, but it is the same process. It is uh, inflammation. The middle word is flame. You need a system that responds with inflammatory warriors when you are exposed to pneumonia, hopefully not exposed to the coronavirus, exposed to a you know, scab on your knee and you want to have some defense mechanism to clean it up. Even with a gout attack, you want the white cells to come in and try and control uh, the situation, but it can go awry. And many of us, unfortunately, don't have pneumonia and we don't have a gout attack, but if we did the right blood tests, we are suffering from excess inflammation. It's a lab situation that can be measured. Now, of course, you might feel inflamed. You all know what that feels like, joints and fingers and swelling. Um, but when it transitions from acute almost appropriate inflammation, illness, to every day of your life, 
being determined, you have inflammation. Now, I do a very extensive panel of blood work on my patients that measures seven different ways to assess inflammation of blood vessels, and a lot of people are walking around with that. Why is that the case? Uh, before we go there, it says appropriately, chronic inflammation is felt to be one of the fundamental root causes. If you want to turn the sink off, you've got to assess and control inflammation. It may be your dental health isn't optimal. You may have a root canal from 30 years ago that has a silent hidden infection causing some sinus problem and it's not resolving. That's an example. Could be your waistline is four, five, six inches too large because we know that the fat around the waist, the visceral fat is more pro-inflammatory than having a little bit under your arms. Uh, whatever you like physically, it's just the truth uh, physiologically. Um, you know, you might be eating food that is inflammatory, which would be processed food. You like your Subway sandwiches or uh, too much sugar uh, in your soda pops. Those can be all inflammatory. Uh, bad interrupted sleep, particularly sleep apnea. Do you snore? Do you breathe? You can easily get checked for sleep apnea now at home, and correcting sleep apnea can help you lose some weight and can help control inflammation. You might have a nutritional deficiency. We've talked a lot at this conference about DHA, EPA, omega-3 foods, omega-3 supplements, good, bad, recommended or not, vitamin D, but sometimes severe deficiencies, which are very common, uh, and finally focusing, I'm gonna actually get my two tablespoons a day of ground flaxseed or chia seeds, uh, or emphasize walnuts over other nuts that aren't as rich in precursors of omega-3 and such. All those things matter, I go through that with everybody uh, you know, in my clinic, and we can correct a lot of it. It's not a new concept. This handsome, handsome man uh, 160 years ago recognized that one of the factors of developing clogged arteries, atherogenesis, the beginning of plaque, is inflammation. It's white cells responding to cholesterol and these crystals entering into the artery through the wall, through the endothelium, and the white cells participate trying to control it, but they become part of the problem. It's called macrophages. So without too much detail, as we go from cleaner arteries on your left to plaque-involved arteries on your right, and then if you look carefully, you can see something that looks like a volcano exploding. It says plaque rupture in little letters away to your right. That's what we believe happens in the moments of a heart attack and stroke very often, that uh, the lining that keeps the bad guys, the LDL, the oxidized LDL, the white cells away from the blood, that the lining could get thin and open up like the top of a volcano. All of a sudden you got a blood clot. But white cells are all over that situation. You want to know and control inflammation. So this was actually just as cholesterol was a theory but now you saw a slide that says LDL cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. We don't think it's a theory anymore. It took decades. The idea that inflammation causes atherosclerosis, heart attacks, and strokes was a theory that really has been promoted mainly in the last 20 years by this gentleman, a esteemed Harvard professor uh, who uh, was involved in developing a blood test you may know of called high sensitivity C-reactive protein. I like to tell little side stories. Harvard owns the patent for this blood test that I've probably drawn 15,000 times on patients, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Your doctor could do it. It's in every lab. You can pay and get it drawn on yourself if you go to a lab like lifeextension.com and some of the others online, wellnessfx.com. But I understand that Dr. Ritker doesn't profit from the patent. It actually goes to support a dog rescue shelter in Boston. If you want a warm fuzzy in your heart, uh, I hope, I've read that, I hope it's true. I've met Dr. Ritker and we share almost the exact same birth date. But um, I didn't actually pin him down to say, is that actually true? That is such a nice story. So Dr. Ritker developed a, a study, this is like his life work, inflammation, heart disease, to ask the question, is it really true that this low-grade inflammation from your poor dental health, from your poor diet, from your excess weight, from your poor sleep, from your sedentary lifestyle, from your processed food and sugar-rich foods and um, trans fats, which have largely been eliminated from the diet, does this really, really work? Can we prove it? And although what I'm going to show you is the data from a study of 10,000 people that was accomplished and presented a couple years ago, it's still kind of a hot topic, the drug that was tested, this wasn't a, 
let's eat green juice study, let's go to Hippocrates Health Institute study, it wasn't that, it was a drug, um, is not gonna be available for this purpose even though the study was quite powerful. So we know about inflammation in our hands. Uh, without boring you, if you look at the liver, which is in the middle at the bottom, you can see a little word there, CRP, uh, and all the liver puts out this chemical. You can measure in the blood, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. But Dr. Ritker knows this whole pathway, how do you get C-reactive protein elevated in your blood? And they found a drug that a little higher up in the pathway blocks the process. And by blocking the process, it lowers C-reactive protein. And they took 10,000 people to ask the question, is that gonna make a difference in their heart attack rate if we lower the C-reactive protein? So the drug won't be coming out. It's several hundred thousand dollars a year. There were side effects of infection rates. But in the people that were on the drug, their C-reactive protein dropped, and the risk, MACE is major adverse cardiac events. The risk of heart attack, stroke, need for bypass and such did go down. That's why there's, the lines here aren't the same. One line was placebo. The lower line was the treated group. You can see the name of the drug. I can't pronounce it, Uh But at any rate, this very expensive study proved the point. You should care about your inflammation. You should measure your inflammation. You should know your inflammation. It turns out, to give you great hope, that there is a diet-based study in heart patients that has been published uh, in 2018. The Evade Coronary Artery Disease Trial asked the question, you've got heart disease, you get put on a whole food plant diet for a year, you get put on a standard American Heart Association diet for the same period of time, can we lower your C-reactive protein? Now, a whole food plant-based diet doesn't cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. It doesn't make you prone to sepsis and, uh, and such matters, and it's something we can embrace much more. Uh, I uh, exaggerated because it was an eight-week study, not a year study, but 100 patients uh, randomized in this way, and the same blood test was the endpoint as was in that Cantos high profile study. People actually like their plant diets. 96% uh, compliance uh, at four weeks, 94%. They didn't send the food back. And when the results were published, you can see the American Heart Association diet on your right. The C-reactive protein before and after measuring the blood was about the same, but it did fall by 26%. Uh, which is actually not that far from how much it fell in that other major trial. Of course, this is only eight weeks. We can't measure how many heart attacks, strokes, and bypasses in eight weeks in 100 people. It takes a study like the other one of 10,000 people over about four years to get those numbers. So you are eating an anti-inflammatory diet every time you eat a sweet potato and a leafy salad and uh, lupini beans or... Uh, white beans or whatever is your favorite lentil and such. So you can reduce inflammation to reduce your risk of avoiding disease. And the practical point I'd suggest to you if you've never had your HS, high sensitivity, C-reactive protein measured, you could ask your primary care doc to do it. It's a simple blood test, every lab does it. If you wanna do it outside the medical world, you can send away your blood to uh, places like Wellness FX lifeextension.com, I think there's a place now called anylab.now uh, in various places. It's not expensive, but eat a lot of plants. Okay, I'm gonna pick up the speed a little bit. Uh, beyond cholesterol, item number two, the gut and the heart. And we gotta give credit to the bright, forward-thinking Hippocrates. So he gets credited with almost everything. We don't know really what he said for sure in most cases. We don't know that he ever said food is medicine, but we think he said, all disease begins in the gut, which makes some sense. You know, really, if you think about it, you got a tube that starts your, uh, your nutrition pathway here, and you got a tube that ends your nutrition pathway down below. And there are other ways to get things in the body through the skin, through breathing. But the majority of what gets in the body, and we think what gets in the body matters for health or illness, is through our diet, through the gut, uh, and good choices is important. So. If I asked how many people in the room are experts on TMAO, a couple, good, um, very good, but it's not wasted time. 
Uh, until 2011, if you walked up to a cardiologist and says, hey, how's that TMAO blood level measurement you're doing in the clinic working for you? We would uh, not have any clue what was being mentioned. TMAO is a molecule that was in the scientific literature for a few decades because it helps fish in very deep oceans stay buoyant. The reason that crushing pressure doesn't cause the fish to be trapped on the ocean floor and unable to swim is they have a buoyancy system, a little bit like a submarine. And TMAO is a buoyant molecule. So that was in the literature. But it turns out a very bright team of uh, scientists at Cleveland Clinic, led by a MD cardiologist named Stanley Hazen. Could be one day he'll be Nobel Prize awarded Stanley Hazen, it's possible. They said, you know, there's more than cholesterol. We've mentioned that. Cholesterol matters, but there's more. Maybe we can find a molecule nobody appreciates that does contribute to heart disease, and then we can fight heart disease more effectively by one more tool. And they had about three items on the list. TMAO was one based on some science. And they went to the lab, and they developed a one-minute version theory that you'll love this as a plant eater, but when you eat red meat, which has L-carnitine, or when you eat egg yolk, which is rich in something called choline, when you have gut bacteria that like to convert those two uh, molecules, you will make a molecule in your bloodstream called TMA. It smells like fish, but quickly your liver will take TMAO, TMA and convert it to TMAO, and it'll be in your bloodstream, and it might promote plaque. That was all a theory based at the Cleveland Clinic. And they quickly did some studies in Petri dishes. If you look at what's in yellow, when TMAO from the steak or the egg is high in your blood, it doesn't let that HDL cholesterol clean up your arteries, take the cholesterol back to your liver. It actually helps other cells put cholesterol into the artery wall through the endothelium, and it increases risk. They could quickly prove that this seemed to be a hot prospect. And as you see there to your left, there's uh, some seafood, but there's largely red meat and eggs. We eat them, humans do. Our bacteria change them into TMA, our liver changes it into TMO, and then we're worried that that helps clog arteries. A completely different pathway than cholesterol. Cholesterol matters. Um, this has been studied in mice. If you feed a mice choline, which is in egg yolk, it's not very much in egg white, all of a sudden you'll have more plaque in the arteries of mice. If you give the mice an antibiotic, it'll kill the bacteria for a while. If there's no bacteria, they can't convert it, you won't have TMAO. So it proved the importance of the gut bacteria in this mouse study. You don't necessarily even have to give them red meat. You can just give them this uh, vitamin called, that vitamin, it's amino acid called L-carnitine. We'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, it is specifically that amino acid that converted by the bacteria into ultimately TMAO. And if you kill the bacteria, you won't make TMAO and you won't get atherosclerosis. So this is actually human data. This is right at the beginning of their project at the Cleveland Clinic. Take a thousand people. Uh, that are going for a heart catheterization, see how blocked their heart arteries are and measure their blood TMAO level. This isn't astounding, but the more blockage you have, the higher is your blood TMAO level. First time that was determined. Gives some clues, this may matter in human disease. Um, they looked at now 1,800 people. They looked at now not cath lab, but do you have clogged arteries in your legs? Do you have clogged arteries in your heart? Have you ever had a heart attack? The higher your level of TMAO, it might one and a half to two times double the risk. And double the risk could be similar to the risk of smoking and heart disease, diabetes and heart disease. So it's not a really unimportant factor. Um, and here specifically in a study now, 4,000 humans, you're two and a half times more likely to have a heart attack, heart event like uh, emergency catheterization and all if you have a high level of TMAO at the Cleveland Clinic, two and a half times. What about eating eggs? A very hot topic, and there's a whole body of data. TMAO is only one small part of the egg story, but if you give volunteers several eggs a day, they will raise their TMAO levels on average. It took more than two eggs to reach a significant rise in TMAO. Won't happen with a sweet potato or sprouts, I assure you. You can see here foods that are rich in the precursors, beef, pork, ham, lamb, veal, processed meats, um, eggs, uh, less, less so dairy, but full-fat products to some. And if you look way to the right, energy drinks and vitamins. 
because it turns out there's a lot of energy drinks, I'll show you a slide in a minute, and there are a lot of vitamins that people take for energy, for brain health that have L-carnitine and choline. If a doctor has told you to do that, discuss it with your doctor, they probably don't know about TMAO. It doesn't mean it's absolutely bad to take a vitamin of that type, but we have to rethink it given the new information. So if you took a can of Monster Drink and you look at the label, you'll see that there is L-carnitine. There's actually quite a bit of L-carnitine, and it can absolutely raise your TMAO level. I've had uh, I have drawn about 5,000 blood levels of TMAO over the last four years and have been able to bring it down by changing the diet, stopping vitamins, stopping energy drinks. Uh, I'm going to pass that for a minute. So, our food should be our medicine, our medicine should be our food, we think, Hippocrates said, and he certainly wouldn't have supported energy drinks. Uh, vegetarians and vegans, as you might imagine from what I told you, um, shouldn't have a high blood level of TMAO unless they're taking these vitamins or energy drinks. But even if you feed, and these are paid volunteers, eight paid volunteers agreed to eat a steak, even though they were vegans uh, by choice, they did not raise their blood TMAO level by one steak because the gut bacteria in a vegan are generally different than the gut bacteria in somebody who generally eats meat-based foods. So we are somewhat protected by it all. The Mediterranean diet, and what is taught usually, avoid red meat and substitute uh, generally fish if you're going to eat an animal product, does lower TMAO levels if it's high at baseline, but vegans will still have the lowest levels. Um, there is a chemical, you know, if you're at the Cleveland Clinic, you have a choice when you have all this data. We should teach the world to eat plants, or let's find a substance we can patent and make a billion dollars. So what do you think the Cleveland Clinic's doing? They're, they got their substance. And the one they're studying uh, most aggressively is called DMB. Don't remember that. Although there may be DMB in balsamic vinegar, and it may be an advantage to have balsamic vinegar or other vinegars in your diet. But it turns out this chemical blocks in the gut wall the enzyme that converts L-carnitine and choline into TMA. They just published two weeks ago the first human data. It is cooking as their project. Uh, I don't know if you can patent this molecule. They probably have slightly modified it so they can patent it and bring it out as a cardioprotective drug. It may be a good thing for humanity because I'm not of the belief everybody's getting to vegan food diets in the next week or so. I think we got a little work to do. There is a blood test that can be checked in people at particular risk or curiosity. Uh, there's a normal range. This used to be a little exotic. It's a blood test I would send to the Cleveland Clinic, but now Quest Labs, of which I have no financial interest, uh, bought the lab at Cleveland called Cleveland Heart, and every Quest Lab in America will draw a TMAO level with a little checkbox. And generally I found it's covered by insurance very readily with a diagnosis of high cholesterol and such. So if you want to know, you can. So it's a consideration, at least avoid the foods and the supplements, L-carnitine, choline, energy drinks, uh, and perhaps you want to check your level. Uh, that's a little bit on the edge in terms of actually solid data. Uh, if you just wanted to confirm that your diet is good and nobody's sneaking anything adverse into anything you're using, you can do that. All right, the last topic beyond cholesterol, three. So we've talked about inflammation, the science, how to check it, TMAO, the science, how to check it. Beyond cholesterol three, um, I would doubt that most of you have read a lot about a form of cholesterol I have not yet mentioned called lipoprotein little a. If you were a marketing firm, you'd get rid of that. It's hard to say, and you have to call it little a, or LP little a, because there is another one that's a capital A. But there is the, you know, in a simple concept, the good HDL protective, the bad LDL lousy, uh, damaging, and now a new one. And it's not so new. 1963, it was identified that some of us have a level in our blood of a certain kind of genetic cholesterol that will never show up on a routine panel. Everybody here, I'm sure, has had at least once their cholesterol checked, and it will never say what your lipoprotein little a level is unless it's specifically checkbox. So you're $30 away, and every lab in America from knowing your lipoprotein A level. But is it inherited by one in a billion people so that it maybe affects seven people in the world or, or maybe not? 
Well, the fact that there's actually already a uh, foundation and all you can go read about uh, suggests it's quite common. Indeed, one out of every four people on the planet, 1.8 billion people have inherited this. This is the most frequent genetic cholesterol disorder on the planet. The one I learned about in training in Dallas when they won the Nobel Prize at the medical center I was at while I was there, it affects about one in 250 people. This affects one in every four persons, so 60 people in this room and thousands of people watching have an elevated level, and it contributes to heart attacks and uniquely clogged heart valves. This is really unique. It clogs up the aortic valve. One out of every seven cases of aortic valve is due to lipoprotein little a. So that is 1.8 billion people. That's a lot of people. And it's understood to be very important, but it's not yet recommended to check it, even though it's available, because we don't for sure know the therapy for it. And some would say, why bother people with information like this? Other people would like to know. Uh, I've been very aggressive about it to the point I have a book coming out in six weeks, which is the first book by a medical doctor on the topic. If you don't want to read the science, which is rather light, I don't like to bombard you with uh, real hardcore science, there are 50 amazing plant-based recipes in the book because of a little aspect of treating lipoprotein little a I'll tell you about, but that book will be out uh, and maybe next year it'll be on the table. So it turns out We've talked about LDL cholesterol. Your doctor gets the labs and says, great news, you've changed your diet, your LDL cholesterol fell to 72, good work. Well, this lipoprotein little a is a bad, bad triple threat. It has the LDL cholesterol there, then it has that semicircle, colorful thing that's called apo little a, and then it also has something called oxidized phospholipids. It's one bad package that's bigger than LDL cholesterol because it has LDL cholesterol plus. So it, it, is, it circulates in the blood. It's a molecule, bangs into walls, and it bangs into 50,000 miles of arteries and bangs into seven and eight uh, tennis courts of endothelium. Uh, and it can do various things. It can cause atherosclerosis, clotting of vessels. It can cause clotting of blood because of its uh, similar shape to plasminogen. And it can oddly actually stick to heart valves and cause inflammation on the aortic valve. So we care about it, and there is this relationship. This is, again, from the American College of Cardiology. There are several thousand research papers on lipoprotein little a, but rarely has it made public attention. The single time I've seen it making public attention was in early 2017, the biggest loser trainer, uh, Bob Harper, had a massive heart attack. It made headlines. And a couple of months later on the medical show called The Dr. Oz Show, uh, he announced uh, to Mehmet, Mehmet, I know I had my heart attack. I inherited this. And the New York Times did an article and other places did. But things like that fade in a while. And I've not seen another celebrity or high profile person talk about it. But um, they may just not know about it. There's another concept real quickly. Uh, I go to my heart doc, I take my blood pressure medicine, I eat my healthy food, I take my cholesterol lowering medicine. I've still got about half the risk of having a heart attack I used to have. I wish it were less than that. I wish I could really make myself bulletproof. Well, it turns out of reasons why you can't make yourself bulletproof according to the medical literature is that lipoprotein A is the single biggest untreated factor in the blood that's still circulating. So we care a lot about it in my field. In the last year, there's now something called a diagnostic code. There never was. So I have in my charts now entered that this person has a lipoprotein little a cholesterol abnormality. Um, that allows me to get their blood test paid for easily, although it really wasn't a problem before there was this code. Uh, so that's kind of a breakthrough. Now, this is kind of fun. This is a study. It's not a perfect study done by a wonderful cardiologist in Houston named Baxter Montgomery. You may be aware of Dr. Montgomery. He does YouTubes and writes and speaks. But he put people on a plant diet like we teach at this meeting. And of the various cholesterol particles that were reduced, you can see the first one on the left is lipoprotein little a. Uh, this contrasts with some data 25 years ago that suggested diets higher in saturated fat lowered lipoprotein A. Now, for a variety of reasons, we're not going to recommend that to people for all the reasons we talked about, but it's so refreshing to see 
that we have the potential. 15% drop in lipoprotein A for many people is not enough, but at least it's a start. Uh, and uh, we're looking at the future right now. There is an agent uh, made by a company called Axia. It's an injectable drug. It's the first drug in the United States that's being studied to lower lipoprotein A, little a. It's an antibody. You know, we're, we need to learn more about side effects and such. But in the headlines, as recently as you can see in the lower right, this was science published about two weeks ago, up to date, the first 200 patients that had heart disease, high lipoprotein A, were given different doses of this drug. It dramatically drops lipoprotein little a by as much as 80%. Diet, I mentioned, maybe 15%. And it was safe and well tolerated. It wasn't a study to say, does it actually reverse plaque? That's about to embark in 7,000 people, and if it all goes well, this drug will be released in 2024 or 2025, which are not palindrome years, but they're still pretty cool years. So we're looking forward to it. So just to conclude and follow up, does cholesterol matter? I hope I've convinced you cholesterol is a risk factor. Cholesterol matters. You should know yours, and you may be frustrated that it hasn't responded for a variety of reasons we talked about. But there are Three, and there's actually 13 I could have talked about. I didn't talk about new 5GC, new 5AC, and meat allergies and others. There's other factors in developing atherosclerosis uh, that either we've known about for a while or are emerging um, and such. I didn't talk about diabetic uh, damage to arteries, smoking damage. But this idea that you can get better and better and better knowing your personal risk. You know, you right now can whip out on your phone and put in a risk calculator. My age, do I smoke, am I on blood pressure medicine, what's my cholesterol, what's my LDL, and get some calculated database that doctors use and is helpful. If you've gone for a calcium score ever, a CT scan of the heart that I order frequently in my clinic and on others, you can go to a website called astrocharm.org, A-S-T-R-O, charm.org, put in your calcium score, put in your cholesterol, put in your blood pressure, a few other things, including the C-reactive protein, if you know it, and you can predict your 10-year risk of a heart attack. That's a better way to assess your personal risk. But we're getting better and better, and we're targeting not just LDL cholesterol, but soon we'll be able to target triglycerides better. We do that now. We'll be able to target um, this lipoprotein little a better, some of which do respond to lifestyle and diet, but not every one of them does. So we do need this combination for the sickest patients of both the excellent lifestyle as well as you know pharma, pharmaceutical agents. Now, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, I think driving to the airport, by a leading preventive cardiologist who practices University of Arizona out of Phoenix, and all she talked about was beautiful drugs, wonderful drugs, beautiful drugs, wonderful drugs. And she's so intelligent, she's so highly regarded. And I know she actually gets that it also matters if you got your gym shoes on and if you ate a salad and if you slept last night and if you have a stress management technique. But they get so excited, it drives me crazy about you know drugs and such. I mean, we need them, but You've seen from the genetic Mendelian studies, the earlier in life when you're not going to put your kid on Lipitor, but you might put your kid on, you know, lettuce, um, the earlier in life you can handle this, the better it'll be. And uh, I think that is the message, you know, as early as you can get everybody around you, you know, eating better. They may not want to do the whole thing. I have three children. They're adults, uh, 20s and 30s. Two are fully plant-based. Uh, one is fully paleo. Uh, he is a whole lot of grilled chicken and a whole lot of broccoli and salad. Uh, you know, you do what you can do. Uh, until he went to Hippocrates eight years ago and spent the health educator course there for seven weeks after three weeks, he didn't eat broccoli. So uh, I give Brian and Anna a big credit for getting him off of beige and into green. Uh, but we're trying to get him off of beige chicken into tempeh. We'll see when that happens. But anyway, I thank you for your attention and thank you for attending the conference. And we'll happily answer questions till I go to the books, until I go to the airport. Yes. I hear you, but not through the microphone. Uh, if you ask a question, I can repeat it. Yeah, well, I'll repeat it. Uh, 
How many people in the audience had ever heard of lipoprotein little a before? Wow. Uh, wow. My first question, and Impressive. since I have the mic, I'm going to ask the first question is, I'm interested in your opinion about the correlation between long-term Hashimoto's disease and high cholesterol for somebody who's followed a whole food plant-based diet, SOS-free, for many years. Okay, so everybody did hear that. Hashimoto's is an autoimmune thyroid disease that can create low thyroid, hypothyroid, but can you can actually have normal labs for a while. It, rarely you actually have elevated labs, hyperthyroidism. There can be different phases. It's autoimmune. That means there's antibodies to the thyroid. You can measure them. They're called antithyroglobulin antibodies and uh, TPO antibodies. Um, we're not certain why you get the antibodies. You'd like an antibody to your pneumonia bacteria. You don't really want an antibody to your uh, thyroid. There's a theory that Hippocrates and all disease begins in the gut, that you may be eating food or have a condition or a deficiency that lets gut contents, and gut contents aren't really lovely things. Uh, they were when we first ate them, but by the time they get in the colon, they're not so pretty anymore. But gut contents spill into the bloodstream, the body reacts, antibodies are made, but oddly they cross-react with your thyroid. There's a theory, there's far from any convincing data, that in some people, gluten can leak across the wall of the gut. We get an antibody, it's not full celiac, but the antibody reacts with the thyroid. And there are some natural health experts that recommend trying a gluten-free diet for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. When you're in the phase of Hashimoto's thyroiditis that you're low, you're hypothyroid, hypothyroidism of any cause, not just the autoimmune cause, maybe you've had your thyroid out because you had a nodule and it was radiated as a kid, but if you're hypothyroid, cholesterol goes up, and that's the main risk of developing coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis is high cholesterol. I do see people that come in, their cholesterol is 270, uh, uh, and they don't know why, but we do a full panel, and they've got hypothyroidism untreated, you treat the thyroid condition and the cholesterol comes down. You didn't need Lipitor. You needed Nature Throid or you needed Synthroid or needed a little iodine. You can measure a blood iodine level. So um, that's the main connection. Just since this is a natural health conference, this has not been a topic, but there is a boatload of high quality science data about the health benefits of exposing yourself to red light. Uh, it's called photobiomodulation in the science, and there's more than a thousand articles in animals and humans, many of them done by Harvard okay. scientist Michael Hamblin, MD, with textbooks on photobiomodulation that thick, that's how much science there is. There, it, there are actual published human studies of sizable numbers, 40, 50 people exposing your thyroid to red light because it can penetrate the skin and near infrared light, and these are actually now relatively inexpensive panels you can buy, can actually cool down and, and convert the thyroid immune system to quiet. And there are people who have gotten off their medicine permanently by that. I think that's ultra cool. Um, so I'm a big fan. I have a red light panel in my house that I use every day I'm at home. Uh, not for my thyroid specifically, but for general health. Uh, maybe we'll have a red light therapy vendor here next year because the science behind it is sufficient to you know, meet any academic criteria. Okay. Hello. Hello, Doc. You go, and then we'll get you. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for that outstanding conference. I'm glad you're the last speaker because my mind is swimming with all the beautiful data you gave me. So thank you once again. I've thank got you. three short questions. One, you mentioned uh, seven inflammatory markers. Could you just briefly tell us those markers? Number two, what is the role of aspirin because the cardiologists push it? And number three, can you just address triglycerides and what's the best way to get it down oh. and what's that role? Okay. okay, thank you. And so first question, if you want to, uh, you know, you can feel inflammation, but if you want to measure it, and I will say there is a difference between inflammation related to rheumatoid arthritis and the inflammation we measure in an advanced cardiology clinic that's felt to be actually inflammation in blood vessels. So um, I do send blood work to Quest. Again, I can't own them. They're a $6 billion company. Uh, but Quest offers, they measure the HSCRP. You saw that on slides, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. There's one called MPO, myeloperoxidase. Myelo usually means something with the blood cells. 
Uh, there's one called um, LP PLA2. It's all on a panel. There's one called oxidized LDL. Uh, there's a urine test for small amounts of protein called MACR. And then there's a urine test for uh, oxidative stress. Uh, it's a complete panel. You don't necessarily need all of them. Uh, they don't, it, very often one's abnormal and two are normal or some combination. So I like a little more comprehensive panel. And the thing is they get better. You can see them improve with fitness, diet change, weight loss, better dental health. I keep bringing that up. It's really important. Can't believe how my patients, you know, it's been four years since I've been to the dentist. No, no, no. Um, I'll tell you one other little pearl. Uh, I have these little strips I use in the office. You just put it on your saliva and in about 15 seconds, the pinker it is, the more nitric oxide exists in your saliva because you're eating your leafy greens and you're eating your beets and you've got healthy bacteria on your tongue. But very often I test somebody because the more nitric oxide, the lower your blood pressure, the healthier your arteries, the better your sexual response. And I see no nitric oxide and I ask the question, by any chance you're using Listerine or Scope? And nine times out of 10, they pull out of their pocket those little Listerine, you know, breath freshener uh, little plastic things, which are rather uh, unpleasant anyways because of the chemicals in them. But it turns out uh, antibacterial mouthwashes that are available in the general public kill important bacteria in your mouth so you can't make nitric oxide in your saliva. And it's like a light bulb goes off. I have a few examples of some natural one. There's one called Hello. It's a mouthwash without antibacterials. And they come back and it's better. And sometimes their blood pressure is actually better. So cool little thing. Number two was aspirin or not. Well, you know, Number one, there absolutely are people who need aspirin. The most important group, if you've had a heart stent in the last 12 months, there's nothing natural that replaces aspirin. And in fact, you're gonna be on two drugs, aspirin plus Berlinta, aspirin plus clopidogrel, uh, aspirin plus effient. If you don't take those drugs, you risk your stent clotting off, which could be lethal. So I also deal with it in the clinic, doc. I'm taking garlic and it's a blood thinner, even though I had a stent three weeks ago, that's when I lose it because um, you don't want to die because you think garlic's better than aspirin. Garlic may work, but we've never studied it. Or I'm a big fan of natta kinase. Some of you know what it is. Or lumbro kinase, but that comes from earthworms. So I don't use that. But natta kinase comes from soy. But there's no data you can use natta kinase to protect your stent. I use it in other situations. Um, so those people always need aspirin. Uh, in late 2018, three studies were published in the same month, September that in total were 45,000 people in aspirin studies. These are expensive, huge studies. One was a group of healthy diabetics, one was a group of healthy 50-year-olds, one was a group of healthy people over age 70. In none of those studies did it come out that just taking a daily aspirin as a general tonic was better than not taking it. Sometimes the stroke and heart attack rate went down, but the stomach bleeding rate went up. So out of that have come a zillion headlines and new guidelines. The general public doesn't need a baby aspirin. It never was about, I've had a bypass, I've had a stent, I had a heart attack four weeks ago. Um, you know, you need an 81 milligram aspirin. I like natural blood thinners. I can't use them in atrial fibrillation either because despite, you know, vitamin E and other things, uh, it's very litigious to take a person with atrial fibrillation and not use Xarelto or Eliquis because they're amazingly effective and really quite safe. But I haven't convinced all my patients of the sanity of uh, embracing some pharmacologic agents. Third question was triglycerides. Um, triglycerides matter. The reason doctors are excited again, there's a fish oil substance called Vasquipa, four grams a day that now is FDA approved lowers triglycerides, and seems to reduce heart attack uh, events. I mean, eating plant-based, whole food, sometimes lowers triglycerides, not always, if you're aware of Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Ornish, and other data, sometimes triglycerides actually go up a little bit while the arteries are cleaning up. So I don't focus that much. Uh, Pre-diabetes, the so-called metabolic syndrome. Get to the gym, lose a couple pounds. Um, eat those omega-3 precursors, chia seeds, flax seeds, very often triglycerides come down. But cardiology has been focusing on LDL, 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 and I think soon lipoprotein, little a, little a, little a, as the you know one or two most important uh, cholesterol particles. Yes, in the back. Oh, okay, we're done? Oh, cool, this has been so much fun. Thank you.